Have you ever wondered how autonomous vehicles deal with complex construction zones? Or how network routers find the most efficient way to send packets across the internet? These problems share something in common. We want to find the shortest route between two points. But it is too expensive to brute force our way and explore all the possible paths. So how do we solve this problem? We do not use deep learning. So we had to default to our alt tricks, to the only thing that us developers know, high school algebra and trigonometry. Today, I'll show you how to find the shortest path using a variation of Dijkstra's algorithm and use it to help ferries to find its way home while dealing with a bunch of creepers. This algorithm is much more efficient than visiting all the nodes. I open source this project. Please consider cloning it so that you can follow along. I would like you guys to collaborate on this project. That way, you'll get real hands-on experience working on Rust. And we will end up with a finished product that it will be better than what any of us could come up with individually. Let's jump right into it. This is a sample graph. We want to travel from A to E in the most efficient way. Efficient means finding the path with the lowest cost. Notice how I assigned a weight of 100 to all the edges that connect to the creeper. This is to make sure that Ferris never decides to bump into one of these guys. Our algorithm requires two data structures, a hash map to store the shortest distance between nodes, and a priority queue to keep track of the nodes that we still need to visit. We'll start by adding our origin node A to the queue with a priority of zero. Total distance is computed as the distance between the nodes plus the distance to our destination E. We will update the distance table only if the measured total distance is lower than the current value. Now let's explore A's neighbors and store the distance into the distance table. The first neighbor that we find is B. Let's add it to the queue and to the distance table. Moving on to C, same deal, but we need to measure the distance to E by hand, which is roughly 2.2. At this point, we are done with A. Let's pop the next element from the priority queue, in this case B, and do the same process all over again. B is connected to both E and D. The distance between B and E is 1. Technically, it's 1 plus 0, so that uh, turns out to be just 1. So we add the total distance to the E column inside the distance table. And we add E to the Q. Then moving on to D, the distance between B and D is 100. So we reflect that both on the distance table and we also push D to the Q. Next, we move on to E. E has two neighbors, B and D. We already visited those vertices, so we will update the distance only if it's lower than the current values. It turns out that the distances from E to B and E to D are not less than the current values. So we just pop E and move on to C. Deja vu. The same thing happens with C. The new distance to D will be higher than the current distance, so we throw it away. Let's move on to D. Same deal with D. There's nothing to update because the distances will be higher than the current values. The queue is empty, which means that our distance table is complete. Let's collect the shortest path using a stack. We start by querying the distance table using the target and walking our way backwards until we get to the origin. Then we reverse the stack, and there you have it, we found the shortest path. We covered the more hardcore aspect of this application. Now let's move on to the easy stuff, the UI. Our previous demos were much smaller and simpler than this app. So we just jammed all the code into the main file, and that was fine. It allowed us to move fast and to get to the point as opposed to wasting hours setting up the project. This project is bigger and more complex, and the stakes are higher. I decided to break the project down to three modules. 
Dijkstra, Model, and Main. Dijkstra contains the implementation of the algorithm that we discussed, plus a test suite that ensures that the system works for the most. Model contains the game struct, which is the most important data structure in the game. It holds the state of the game. One cool thing about my design is that you can move forward and backward in time because we store every single move. Each move is stored into a game state object. If you want to pick at the current state of the game, you need to look at the last element of the moves vector within the game object. I added a minimal battery of tests to this struct to prove to myself that I could query vertices in a reliable way. Moving on to the main file. This is where most of the U code lives. If you're wondering how we refresh the screen, that will be in the game root component. Game root is responsible for showing the instructions to the user. Listening for key events and for refreshing the screen every 500 milliseconds. Notice how we communicate with the game context using messages. This is a very clean way to isolate your UI code from your model. The files generated by TrunkServe are stored to the docs folder so that I can serve the game as a static website using GitHub Sites. This is just for demo purposes. Please show your support by subscribing to this channel and I encourage you to participate in this project. There are so many open issues for you to take on. It is a great way to learn Rust and get to know awesome people in this super tight U community. Ciao.